Very good afternoon everyone and welcome to episode 11 of Ghost Variations here at Jessanori, direct from my study. Um, we are going today to Germany and it's 1933. Ulrich Schultheis, assistant editor at the music publishers B. Schott und Söhne in Mainz, had not slept for five nights, possibly ten. Sometimes, switching on the wireless to hear the news, which was often no longer news but whitewashing, he suspected he might never sleep again. The Chancellor had declared his political party the only one in Germany, effectively banning all others. That seemed to confirm Uli's worst suspicions that Hitler was not only dangerous but medically insane. Mainz, Uli thought, should have been a small enough town not to feel the shifting tectonic plates of world politics. All that changed when the director of the local conservatoire, Hans Gall, a fine composer and even finer man in Uli's view, was evicted from his post one month after the college had renewed his contract. It contravenes the law, surely, said Uli to his boss, Ludwig Strecker, the joint proprietor of the firm with his brother, Willi. Two tall men in their fifties, blessed with imposing Roman profiles and a steely charisma fed by the endurance tests of the 1914 to 18 war. The Strecker brothers were on first name terms with the entire music world of Central Europe and beyond. Law? What law? Ludwig said. These madmen can do whatever they want. Gull is Jewish and he's out. It's nothing to do with his music or his teaching, let alone the law. But why does nobody do or say anything? Why aren't there protests? Visiting the conservatoire to see a friend, Uli had found its stone staircases and dark wooden doorways echoing with the usual whales, scales and studies, the corridors dotted with students smoking after class while professors lunched in the cafe opposite. Business as usual, but without Hans Gull. You can't be surprised if people are afraid to speak out. But if they can force this, what next? If people just let things happen? Ludwig was shaking his head. Uli knew that he had experienced the trenches and still had nightmares about them, though he rarely spoke of it. You're very young, was all Ludwig said. The gulls made a furtive visit to Willy Strecker's family to say farewell one night when Uli happened to be there for dinner. They were leaving, they said, so that their friends would no longer be compromised by seeing them. Third Reich officials were observing and noting every move of the town's Jewish citizens. Don't those busybodies have anything better to do with their time, Uli grumbled. The gulls walked away across the square with their two sons, avoiding the streetlights, heads down, dark hats and scarves all but concealing their faces. With a fearful lurch, Uli wondered when he might ever see them again. He shut himself inside the cloakroom for a few minutes so that his boss would not witness his emotions getting the better of him. He had seen it approaching, yet he didn't want to believe it. It had been baking at the back of the depression's oven for years. The new recipe of this nationalist cake Thick textured and full of nuts, Uli thought, lured disaffected young people who couldn't find jobs since there were none to be had. It seemed aromatic too for older folk who could blame anyone but the government and world finances for what was going on. Immigrants, Jews, gypsies, sodomites and anybody who dared to ask too many questions. Uli could easily have been part of that. His father never came back from Ypres and he still recalled the anguish of mortification when he arrived at school during the war in a blazer three sizes too small, light-headed and nauseous because there was no breakfast to eat nor any lunch to look forward to. He thanked God and his mother for his music. In contact with the piano keys and the spirits of Beethoven, Bach or Schumann, 
he felt the world's madness give way to beauty, inspiration and order while the music lasted. He wished to serve that beauty, inspiration and order. Now, working for Schott gave him the chance to do so. And so the Streckers and Uli with them watched, waited and fought what corners were theirs to fight, namely those of the composers whose works they published. Each morning, Uli bicycled to the office from his flat on the outskirts of Mainz, a small apartment with a living room occupied mainly by his Beckstein piano. He would ride along by the River Rhine, past the dusky pink stone of the ancient cathedral, and into the medieval streets of the town centre, cobbles under his wheels, oak-beamed facades around him, as pretty as a set for Humperdinck's Hensel and Gretel, which Schott published, and as German as one for Wagner's Die Meistersinger from Nuremberg, which Schott's also published. On the, on the Weihergarten, he left his bike outside the building, then unlocked the heavy wooden door that led to the main staircase between the street and the courtyard. There in the hall, he found himself face to face with Richard Wagner. Good morning, Herr Richard, Uli said silently to Wagner's bust. It had a noble mien, much idealised, and Uli never failed to bid it good morning. Wagner's operas brought the company coffers quantities of income. They owned the old codger a dreadful debt of thanks. And whatever you thought of the man, his unspeakable arrogance and the suspicion that every time he looked in a mirror he saw Nietzsche's Superman, there was no getting away from the glory of his music. He had unveiled the libretto of Die Meistersinger to Willi and Ludwig's grandfather downstairs in the same office as some 70 years earlier. The Strecker brothers, having inherited the family business, insisted that nothing in that historic space must be changed. So the Wagner room kept its character, the fine-limbed wooden furniture, the graceful cornicing and a very elderly piano, nobody dared to touch it now, on which Liszt and Wagner had both played. While other firms moved to Berlin to be at the centre of German cultural life, Schott stayed put, their location and history prime assets. Here in Mainz, Johannes Gutenberg had invented the modern process of printing, now the Streckers kept their products rolling off the presses not a mile away from that first machine. And Uli, as general all-round right-hand editorial man, would make certain that everything was progressing smoothly and on time. Beauty, inspiration and order. Strange ideals, perhaps, at a time of fire, of the Reichstag, of books, of democracy itself, but one's only to be found in art. Tough day ahead, Uli, Wagner's bust seemed to warn him that morning. Hold on and keep your strength. You're going to need it. Fräulein Kemmerling tapped on his office door minutes later. Dr Schultheis, I have a call from Herr Dr Professor Donald Tovey at Edinburgh University. He wanted Dr Strecker, but please could you speak to him? Willie was away in Munich meeting another composer, Karl Orff. Tovey? On the phone? Of course, please put him through. While he was Schott's representative in London, before the Great War lobbed him into the indignity of the Alexandra Palace internment camp, which was not palatial at all, Willi Strecker served as Tovey's unofficial concert agent and business manager, as well as his, his publisher. Schott still published his compositions. Uli listened as Tovey explained the developments at the Daranyi and Fakiri family home, his incredulity growing with every word. A Schumann violin concerto? Messages from a glass game? The whole thing had to be a joke. A Schumann concerto turning up would be astonishing, but who in the name of heaven is going to believe this? Excuse me a moment. <coughs> Just tea, not the virus, I promise. Who in the name of heaven is going to believe this? And from Joachim's great nieces. 
Professor Toby, these ladies may be amazing musicians. I remember hearing Yelly play when I was a boy, but they're having you on. You'd been barely 11, visiting family friends in Surrey a year or so before the war broke out. He retained a faint image of a slender, scarlet-clad, flame-like presence whirling through Beethoven, Brahms and something very Hungarian. He thought her beautiful but a little weird, as if she had landed on the earth from a distant world, perhaps a bird changed into a woman by some inverted Ovidian metamorphosis. I'd love to tell you this is one big jest, said Toby, but Yelly and her sister are not like that. In a funny kind of way, they're innocents. They don't know how to be dishonest. They grew up with a ferocious father. Can you imagine? Head of the police in Budapest. So, you're convinced they're not making it up and they haven't just stumbled upon something Uncle Yo once said over the palinka. There is a concerto and its existence is noted in at least one very good book. And no matter how it has come to our attention, it's time to find it. Here is my question. Do you think the doctors Stracker might consider helping to track it down on the premise that they may then publish it? Uli thought fast. It would be an amazing stroke of fortune to lay hands on such a work, especially if it turned out to be as good as Schumann's piano concerto. Perhaps Willy could write to Joachim's son. I'm sure he mentioned he was interned together with him in England during the war. Odd, he reflected, that bonds forged in deprived communal conditions over scant meals or at unthinkable toilet facilities could be stronger by far than those made over champagne cocktails at the Hotel Adlon. He had never had friends as close as those he made in childhood stealing apples and pears from the orchards and gorging on them by the brook through the meadows. They were all hungry, they all had nothing to lose, and they would never forget one another's parlous state in those days, no matter how well subsequent fortune might treat them. Uli, I'd be most grateful if you could run this by him, or at least the existence of the piece. There's no need to mention the uh, spirit aspect. I've had to almost physically restrain Yelly from jumping on the first boat to go and look for the manuscript herself. Perhaps she should, said Uli. Awkward and potentially dangerous. Joachim. Oh, God. At least they're in Britain, said Toby. At least they're safe. A circuit connected in Uli's mind. Toby's tone was tremulous enough to tell him that the Durangi sisters' safety meant the light of the sun and moon to this revered academic. Yelly is playing the supposedly Mozart Adelaide concerto in November. I believe you've published it, so why don't you come over for the concert? Then you could meet her and see for yourself. Thank you, Professor Toby, said Uli. I might just do that. Thank you very much. That is the end of today's episode. Please come back tomorrow to check on the state of Yelly's cathedral tour. Bye.